with Nick Booth. Hey, Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to you for joining us at home. Um, tonight in the house, we're actually celebrating the launch of Nick Booth's latest book, The Search for Life on Mars. Now, Nick has actually been a writer for over 30 years, and this is his latest book, co-written with Elizabeth Howell. Um, once again, it's a pleasure to have you tonight, Nick. Um, do you want to just give a little bit of background uh, to the audience tonight as to um, your background and sure. of your pre uh, career? Okay, um, I'm not on. I'm not under oath, so I can, you know, can say a few ridiculous things, right? So, uh, I was a newspaper reporter for ten years. So, during those ten years, from 1989 to 1999, I was in the very lucky position that I could talk to all the big names in space research. Um, I was a science writer, and then I was a technology editor on the time. So, I was a, a lucky boy, really. So. What happened was that in those years, it was really quite an exciting time because after a certain amount of neglect, NASA had decided it was going to return to Mars in a big way. And unfortunately, in 1999, the two missions that it launched both crashed for reasons which are you know, most people know now. And I'd been scr scrolling away notes and realised, actually, you know... I, it's a bit off-putting. I mean, bad enough for me writing about it compared to the poor people who'd actually built these missions. And so I just abandoned it. And then in the meantime, a whole new generation of very fine reporters and writers have come along, including Elizabeth, who is Canadian. Uh, she has a PhD, and she's a very, very fast writer and a very good writer. Um, in the Since we finished the book about a year ago, she's written two more books, and she's got a third. I've done a bit of gardening, so that shows that's, you know, that's what's, what's happened, really. But seriously, no, she's um, reports and has been reporting since 2004. So between us, we've got sort of 35. And for me, in my early years, because I was a teenage space cadet, I managed to persuade JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to give me a job. So I was sort of Doogie Howser space cadet kind of kid, talking to people as far back as that. So... I'd like to think that the book is the distillation of the old and the, the new and has probably a reasonable amount of new stuff. Um, and a couple of people have been very kind to say, there's one distinguished person, I won't say his name because it's embarrassing for him. Um, he said, I, the stuff in your book, even I didn't know. So I was quite pleased with that. So if there's one thing I know about is Mars. Uh, ask me about any other planet and I'm completely in a fog, but Mars I, I do know about. Well, don't worry. Tonight we're only going to be talking about Mars. Um, and another fun fact uh, for the audience tuning in, uh, and you missed it, is a little bit of your academic background is after studying physics at London University, you were actually the youngest Briton to ever work for NASA. Ta da! Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, it's a strange story. I mean, I just was mad keen on space as a teenager. And between the lower sixth and the upper sixth, which is just before you graduate for any non British viewers um voyager 2 was flying past saturn and i got it into my head that i could go and work at the jet propulsion laboratory for that summer so whereas most kids go out and play football or go to the pub or whatever i was writing letters um and by a series of very odd coincidences and things the letters were answered by the right people and they said okay this kid give him you know uh, show him or give him a job for the summer so that was pretty nifty I mean, there are other people, um, I know Libby Jackson, who was on, when she was 17, she worked for the Johnson Space Centre on the human side. So yeah. there's a few there's a few sort of people who've done that. And, uh, you know, it was great. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I did it at that age. That's great. It's such a great experience to have at such a young age. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and in an odd way, it made, it did for me actually doing research because I met Richard Feynman. And yeah. I am the only person I know who ever met Feynman and was inspired not to do physics, purely because he was a genius. Yeah. And I realised how second, third and even fourth rate I would be. But the interesting thing was he and his student, who I stayed with that summer, a guy called Al Hibbs, um, they both said, mm -hmm. you can write. Why don't you, you know, go over there, boy, write. So I, that, that's what I sort of did. And it took me a few years to do. So. The interesting thing is with the space business now, 
um, those days you either did engineering or you did physics and there the twain would meet. And now there are many more opportunities for many people. So if anybody's watching this and thinks I'm not good at maths or whatever, don't worry, you'll find a niche and there's enough opportunities now to, to go and do actual you know, useful work in the space business. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's what we talk about on most of our Thursday night talks is even if you have a niche, space is going to have a place for you. The space yeah. industry is going to have a job for you, uh, yeah. especially at the rate it's growing. Um, you mentioned the spark for writing at a younger age. So let's talk about the book. OK, um, we'll be here all night. You realise that, don't you? <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm sure our viewers would love to hear more about it. Um, okay. So just like start from the very, 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 very beginning. Like um, you said you wrote, um, you, were, you were writing in the space industry um, some time yeah. ago. Um, so why after such a pause and like, what was the story behind the, the story? The story behind the story. Okay. Yeah. I got into interested in space because the Viking missions landed when I was 12. And I think everybody who's 12 should have a space mission that they hold really close to their heart. So that's got what got me started on Mars. I, when I, even when I was at school, I used to write to JPL for, you know, really, really technical documents. There's one called the Mars Reference Atmosphere. And I remember it came to, and I was looking at it, and the teacher said, what do you want that for? And I said, it's important. And it, <laughs> it, it was. And it was. Um, so I, that's how I started, I'm thinking that I would go off and do research and, yeah. you know, write about it as a hobby. But the way... It happened was I did my degree. I then worked for Astronomy Now magazine when it started yeah. out. Um, and then I did stuff for newspapers. So I, as I say, I was in this very lucky position that people were paying me good money and I could go and talk about Mars, which I did for at least 15 years. And some of the veterans of Viking, we'll come to that a bit later, I think, um, some of whom have, have since died because they're, you know, they're, a lot of that first generation of, people in the space business they you know they've long since gone so yeah. just for me talking to these guys with this kind of stuff that they did in those days because it really was a new frontier it had not been done before um i then in the 90s was talking to the next generation of people who'd come along and the interviews are in the book there's a guy called michael malin who's built most of the cameras that have been to mars in the last 25 years um, I interviewed at great length Donna Shirley, who was the project manager for the first um, rover, the, the Sojourner rover, which was tiny. It's like, imagine putting a few wheels on a, on a microwave. And uh, just the other day, I was looking through some notes I'd made and realised she sent a mission to Mars. It landed perfectly. It worked for 58 days. She, we were in a car because she was giving me a lift because she was very busy. And I said, I'll carry on interviewing you. So I interviewed her. And we got lost. So I think I got the right, I got into the right business because mm -hmm. navigation isn't my greatest thing. So I've been going to Pasadena for about 15 years by this point. We managed to get lost, but there we go. So I was very lucky because I knew a lot of these people even before I became a reporter. So they sort of knew who I was yeah. and I talked to them, you know, as a kind of starry eyed kid. And really, even when I was reporting, I mean, you know, what a great job to be able to have. Um, so I, I did that for the best part of 15 years Yeah, yeah. and I've done other things and then Elizabeth started so be, as I say between us we must have spoken to it's getting on for about 200 people over the years and you know everything that we've learned is in the book that's great uh, just a reminder to everyone who's tuning in on YouTube and if you're on Zoom so please send in your questions via the comment section below um, and hopefully I can also uh, direct your questions towards Nick. Um, so anything you're curious about, anything you want to know about Nick's career, about the book, uh, why you should go and get it, um, drop them in the but comments. Mars, Mars is more interesting than my career, but you know, the, I, I'm sure I can, I can shine a, few, a little bit of light on Mars. Definitely. And I'm sure um, there'll be some inspiration uh, to our viewers tonight. Um, so yeah, let us know in the comments section below if you have any questions um, about Mars or about Nick, we'll be happy to answer those. Um, one thing I actually wanted to ask you uh, before we started talking more about Mars was how was it 
um, writing with a co-author because I think um, you know, the first author I've spoken to who is um, co-authoring a book. Uh, it's great. Right. I've spoken to people who have written their own book and they've kind of just controlled yeah. it. Um, yeah. Um, well, what happened was we, uh, I found half the book because it was on discs in, in my mum's attic. So, and I was looking and then I was talking to Elizabeth and I said, do you want to work together on a book? And I said, let's do a, let's do a test of a chapter, first of all. Okay. And it was utterly painless. It was great. Our styles are different. So yeah. it wasn't like we were arguing over every single word. Yeah. Um, she went off to JPL, talked to people. She'd been talking to people. She's a reporter. I would edit her stuff. She would edit mine. And it's great because you just, you know, co-pilot to pilot. We need 200 yeah. words there. But the next day it would turn up. And I can, I'm genuinely saying this. I'm not because I'm not one of nature's generally tactful people. But uh, it was a blast. It was great. And also, I look at the book now and I read bits and think, I think that was, they said that to me, but I don't, and I genuinely do not know who, who you know, which of us did it. And that's hopefully the, the measure of it being, uh, you know, a, a good collaboration. Mm -hmm. And being Canadian, she got some of the jokes. The American editors didn't, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. No, it, but it's, it, been, it's been great. It's, it's if, you, if you've never written a book before and you're worried about it, get a co-author um, because mm -hmm. it is, you know, you, yeah. it, it, halves the load of work that you've got to do yeah well, that's great that's great that you enjoyed it and it was a seamless a seamless yeah. ride yeah that's it good. was it was great i mean just because you know um we're both still enthusiastic about mars and we yeah. were both yeah. like wow and you know she went to jpl just over a year ago mm -hmm. so she spoke to a load of people and one of the interviews in the book with a young uh, structural engineer is genuinely brilliant i mean he's very funny um, you just read the book about some of the things because he was, you know, took himself too seriously. And there's some great quotes in that. And that's the great thing, because we are just the people with the pen and yeah, we get yeah. to talk to these great people. Um, so we're very, very lucky to be able to do that. That's great. Um, now, since we are speaking to a Mars expert tonight, uh, my first question on Mars um, has to be, do you think there is life on Mars? And if yes, what form do you think it will be? Let's start with the simple question and the easy one first, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. No, no. Um, I think there is life on Mars. I think it will be very tough to find. But if it's as easy to find as some people are suggesting, then yeah. it should be somewhere just under the surface. The problem is that dealing with an utterly hostile environment and it's an utterly hostile environment a planet that has been you know degrading for four and a half well four billion years at least yeah so if life started it would have started sometime in the ancient past the other interesting thing is mars and earth have been for want of a better expression if anybody's eating turn away now they share spit the two planets have been sharing rocks and all sorts of stuff so <laughs> It could well be that Mars was the incubator yeah. and some of this stuff came to the Earth or vice versa. Um, but yes, I do think there will be some signs of life, whether you whether it will be you know alive now or it'll have died out, that you should be able to find out and see if there were traces of this. These yeah. are the infamous biosignatures. Um, as to where that will be, it's probably somewhere deep under the surface, probably somewhere that's you know has been shielded for many millions of years and the problem with that is they're not the areas that you can land safely so yeah. yes i think there'll be life there it will be the form of microbes that will be ancient that might have died out but there'll, there'll be trace evidence for that but trying to get hold of, of that evidence will it's not you know you're not going to land and pick something up it's going to take another series of steps but yeah. I think if it's there, it will be found. Yeah, so it's not going to be sitting behind a rock. No, or under a rock or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of. It, it might be a few. There was a paper that came out last year that said you have to dig deep. And they're talking about two miles. Now, the InSight lander that landed 18 months ago, yeah. it's had a devil of a year trying to drill two feet. And every yeah. time it's drilled, it's popped back up again. It's the only part on Mars where this, this seems to have happened. So, again, that's a sort of, you know, will you be able to send drilling teams that might be able to do that? 
yeah. that's you know a fundamental question for the future but i think the evidence there will be evidence there and certainly of the steps just to the prebiotic chemistry which is the interesting point at which life formed yeah and do, do you think it's going to be different to terrestrial terrestrial life that is a really good question because fundamentally the missions that look the viking missions looked and they, they had to make a series of assumptions one was is the life going to be like earth life that's adapted or is it going to be completely different yeah. And since then, I think people have realized, one, life is hardier um, than, than they thought it was. And, you know, life forms of microbes have been found inside nuclear rods in you know, two miles under some basalts in Washington state. So I think, yeah, um, will we be able to, you know, what, what form will it be? It will be something like that. Great. Well, um, let's let's wait and find out. And yes, yeah. so we're asking these really fundamental questions, and as soon yeah. as you ask them, it's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it is exactly my thought. It's, I as it, I was just stuck with the idea of a drilling team on Mars. That's right, because you're an engineer, so of course you'd be, you know, you'd be there with chewing on a cigar <laughs> and doing all that. Yeah, I mean that's what they, that, but that's what they would be talking about to be able to do that. Um, when that would happen, you know, that's not going to be next year. Uh, Elon Musk isn't going to do it. it it'll be yeah. a few, you know, it might be a couple of centuries yet, but I'm sure um, if people think there's, and there's evidence and that they will, um, you know, they, they might find it. And it, But that's what it might it might take. So that's why I say you're not going to land and go, oh, there it is. You mean a couple of decades? A couple of decades, yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing, because... <laughs> The first human missions to Mars, since I was a lad, are always two decades away. And what's changed uh, that I've since I was a kid, and in fact, my I didn't say my first book was about Mars with ITN, the yeah. news company, and we did a book about going to Mars. It was called Race to Mars. It was meant slightly as a pun, which nobody got. Um, and it was how you might go to Mars. This was in 1988. And it seemed science fiction, whereas now... And we end the book because purely, not that we were very clever, but we knew that there would be an election after the book came out. And it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. So we stop with human exploration. I'd have liked to have done the human stuff, but there just wasn't enough room. And you've got to realise as a writer, you've got to stop. Yeah. yeah so we stopped. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, when you were writing it, um, did you come across anything that you didn't know before? Yes, I do lots of things. Sorry, you ask, you seem to be asking me questions when I'm trying to have a sneaky cup of tea. Hold on. Sorry. The interesting thing we found, yeah. which was this. Every year, half a tonne of Mars lands on the Earth. Now, it's not all in one go. If it was, you know, yeah. you, you would notice that, right? Half a tonne. So, half a tonne. So here's what's happened. This thing about sharing spit. The early years of the solar system were messy. The planets were being bombarded. They were being hit by asteroids, meteorites, all this sort of stuff. They were blasting loads of stuff off into space. And a lot of this material has been kicked off of Mars and it has been fl floating around and they come and crash onto the Earth. And that's where the half a ton comes from. Over the years, over geological time, the best place that, to find them is Antarctica because the Antarctic ice sheets are flowing. And, you know, if stuff's landed and they've been deep mm -hmm. within the ice, they appear. So every year since 1976, scientists go down to Antarctica, which is the nearest Mars-like place in terms of hostility and cold that mm. you can have on Earth, and they're picking up samples of rock. Um, in 1979, there was one rock that they found, and it had a, a, a bubble of gas trapped in it, and they took that mm. piece of that bit of gas out mm. and mm. compared it to measurements that had been taken on the surface of Mars, and voila, they coincided. So they knew pretty well that the, 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 these meteorites that had come from Mars. And it's really the only free lunch in astronomy because it, it means that people have been able to look at Mars um, without having to go there. Um, but the problem is what they don't come with is a, a sort of sustainability label telling you where they came from. And so you're looking at bits of rock from Mars that you don't know where they, they originated from. Um, and that, is, in a simple way, is if you want to go to Mars <clears throat> and find something 
that you want to look at and know exactly where it's come from. You go there and pick it up and bring it back. So it's a free lunch, but it's, it might be not the, you know, the hors d'oeuvre that you ordered. It might be something else, if, to use that analogy. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I, I don't think many people knew that, that actually Mars rocks do land here on Earth. That's yeah. one fact for the day. That's a fact for the day. And also, it was famously, talking about the search for life on Mars, it was one such piece of Mars that, that is quite ancient. Because when I was reporting, so in the 90s, there was something like a dozen, I think, that, of Martian, that were known to be Martian. And there was one that was very, very odd because it was a different colour. Uh, when it was picked up in 1984, the person who picked it up wrote on the notes, Yowza, Yowza. So they knew even then when they picked this thing up, that it was, it was different. Um, it was older. And this is the famous Allen Hills meteorite in which a group of NASA scientists and British ones who started the, the ball rolling discovered yeah. what eventually the NASA team were convinced was life on Mars. And that was, you know, that was, that was the most exciting night I ever had as a, I mean, but it was exciting enough as a reporter, but the people who had actually done the work, who we've spoken to, was even more exciting. So the, the interesting thing with that is the problem all along was the evidence was always fairly circumstantial and subsequently people have said, well, you can explain this and blah, blah, blah. The mm -hmm. biggest problem is it's, there's no context. You, you don't know where this came from and you can't sort of trace back, of, well, was it likely to have been this temperature, blah, blah, blah. But what that whole discovery did, it prompted the new era of, of research and astrobiology because people got together and realized, okay, if we looked at all these different elements and pull them all together, we can create a whole new field here. So mm -hmm. I was there at the, you know, reporting on it when it was taking off. And what's great now is that the kind of end result of all that work is now on its way to Mars, even as we speak. Yeah. Well, what are your memories of the meteorite story in 1996? It was incredible because it was such a strange story because um, it started as a rumour. It was yeah. leaked and... I was supposed to be meeting somebody and then it all kicked off. And I actually said the line that it sounds like the first draft of a really bad Adam Sandler movie, but I did actually say it, which was, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be late. It looks like NASA's discovered life on Mars. So yeah. there was all this, the rumours, and then a press conference was brought forward and the paper was brought forward. Everybody who was involved was on holiday. So... We you were know, trying to get a hold of people to discuss this because you couldn't get a hold of anybody. And then it just literally was what they call their Pearl Harbor moment. And it really was, um, it was exciting beyond belief to realize. And it was such a, such a left of field discovery because the, the interesting thing with the meteorites is the Martian meteorites were the first bits of Mars that ever anybody ever found organics in. And those are those really complicated molecules of you know when you do chemistry at O level or something you've got those long involved chains mm -hmm. of that's the kind of bi biochemical backbone for life mm -hmm. and when the vikings had landed they'd not found any game over so it was thought so 10 15 years later suddenly bloom these are the organics and they're found in in these meteorites the alan hills meteorite the 1996 one you know that was well here's organics and the different forms of carbon and they clumped together and blah, 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 and it could be life. Um, and the, the most significant thing to do with Mars in recent years was the, it was two years ago, uh, was the, the discovery, or rather the paper, that the Curiosity lander had discovered ancient organics. So it had drilled a hole, they'd taken a sample out, and they'd looked and they found, it's the first time anybody's done that. And if, you, if there's organics on the surface, then that's a pointer towards mm. there could be life. The kicker is those organics could have come from elsewhere. They could have come from meteorites and comets. and be, But the, the great mystery was, why were there no organics on Mars? And now, now we know there are. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely, um, there's definitely hope. There's hope. Yeah. There's, there's perseverance and there's the, the yes, yeah, sorry. I sound like a local radio DJ, don't I? But I think that's the significant thing, that the fact that now, the sensitivities of the instruments and looking through these cores, they found, um, you know, ancient organics. And the, the older they are, the greater the chance that Mars 
you know, as I say, it's been very hostile for at least four billion years. But in the early years, it probably had a magnetic, it had a field, um, a, a, it had a core yeah. that generated a field. And if you've got a field, you've got a shield against all the radiation from the sun and elsewhere. You've got conditions, there's enough evidence been amassed that there was water on the surface of Mars. There may even have been certainly lakes that might have spilled over that formed with the seas in the northern hemisphere of Mars, you put all that together and you've got the ideal conditions to create life. And that really is where the next missions come in. Yeah, well, stepping away from Mars just a little bit uh, and going back to your early career, uh, when you were at NASA, and we spoke about this a little bit offline, but you said you wanted to tell me a story um, about the people you met in a corridor. And we said, oh, yeah. keep, it, keep it live. So even I, I haven't heard this story yet. So no, it's okay. Th that wasn't then, that was when I was a reporter. Okay. Anybody watching this, being a reporter about space is great, but it's not the same as actually doing the work, right? Because for many, many years, I've watched documentaries about Hubble Space Telescope and you see all the famous names being interviewed. And I've seen the back of my head and the side of my nose in those documentaries when I was at the press conferences. And that's what this story was about. The Hubble Space Telescope had been launched. The mirror was slightly the wrong shape. So the astronauts went on the first sort of servicing mission and put various pairs of glasses in front of the mirror so that everything was in focus. So I was reporting. I was in Washington, DC, and we're at the American Astronomical Society. And NASA bust us to it was NASA Goddard. I, I, I can't quite remember. There's NASA headquarters on NASA Goddard. Yeah. We went there. Trouble with Hubble. Over. So again, I'm standing there with a piece of paper and, a thing, and I'm standing in a corridor. Right. So this is the point of this story. In reverse order, the people who came out of a door right in front of me. So the last person was John Young, the astronaut. You know, six space flights into the moon twice. Had the Challenger not blown up, he would have been the first, he would have been the commander of the mission that would have launched Hubble. So he was obviously still interested. So he walked past and I'm like, oh. And then the person before was Nancy Roman, who was head of astronomy at NASA headquarters for many years. And she'd said yes to the project in essence. And some of you may know one of the next space telescopes has just been named after her, the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. And the very first person who came out was a guy called Jerry Soffen, who was, a, who was a scientific hero of mine because he was the project scientist on Viking, which we can come to. So I'm standing in a corridor and all these great names came out of this door. And you know the bit in Help, the Beatles movie, where they all come out the front door and they all, and I was convinced there must be some sort of special meeting room where all the great names of space live. So that was that <laughs> story. But Jerry Soffen was um, a biologist He'd studied at UCLA, he'd then gone to Princeton and became interested in the philosophical aspects of uh, life in space. He joined JPL, and this was the time in the 60s when the field of exobiology, as it was known then, was just starting out. And a lot of people were very sniffy about it. So what he had a fight on his hands, in a sense, to try and get other biologists interested in doing this stuff, because... Nobody had looked at the planets for the best part of 50 years because of Percival Lowell and all the canals. And it was you know, completely disreputable. So he sort of was one of the few people who got people to or got the rest of the scientific community to take this stuff seriously. And he was he ended up as being the project scientist, which really was the kind of peacemaker. because You've got all the scientists arguing with each other and the engine, you know, engineers always don't like the scientists because they're always ungrateful and they're always asking for more and you know, mm -hmm. want more money and they want stuff and it doesn't work in the chain. Blah, blah. And, you know, scientists are always moaning about the engineers. They're boring, they're bureaucrats. They're, and all that. He was the peacemaker. And one of the amazing things about Viking was both spacecraft, well, there were two of them. There was a lander and an orbiter with each. They all worked perfectly well. And he was, you know, kind of one of my heroes. And I met him and then... We chatted then and interviewed him in 1996 and 97 at length. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, in 2000. So those interviews are in the book. And he said something really which I thought was quite neat, which was, so he'd, he looked for Long Mars for 15 years. The Vikings didn't quite find it. We can talk about that. But he then said he went to Harvard, took a sabbatical, and on the first 
day he wrote on the blackboard hello earth goodbye mars because and then he sort of looked at biology on earth and then was a, a liaison for nasa so i was very lucky to meet these well, and in the case of jerry soffin have a long and involved series of conversations with him because they were the people who had done this originally yeah well we've mentioned viking a few times yeah uh, so maybe if you want to tell uh, the audience what 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 viking was and how did it work right okay it's a good question the first missions to the planets in the 60s were called Mariner, and they were each one built on, well, so the first Mariner 4 flew past Mars. Five years later, Mariner 6 and Mariner 7, slightly bigger, had more uh, complicated instruments. They also flew past. 1971, Mariner 9, and there was Mariner 8, which crashed, because that's the hidden history of Mars. Uh, more than half of the missions that are sent there have never quite made it. And Mariner 9 was an orbiter, and looked for landing sites. And so building on that, NASA decided to, to have the most complicated mission ever built. At the time they were doing this, because yeah. I was a kid, and Mission Impossible was on the telly, uh, you know, before the films, and it was like Mission Impossible. They had to build two sets of identical spacecraft, not knowing quite where they might land. They had to have brand new instruments they had to they invented a new form of rubber to put some of the instrument it was amazing of what of how they actually did this and it cost two and a half billion pounds and it was the bit sorry dollars i should say in 1970s money and it was sold to congress as this is the kitchen sink we're taking it to mars we will find evidence for life if it's there and it was the big space mission as i say of my youth they landed in 1976 there were three biological instruments on board, or rather. So what happened was there was a sample arm, took a scoop of sample, dropped it through a hopper, went through a hopper into the biology instruments. Two of the instruments worked on the principle that uh, there would be life, as in terrestrial life, that would adapt to Mars. And there was a third mm -hmm. one that, that wasn't, that would look unequivocally if there was any, it didn't matter what the environment was like. And on the first run in 1976, the end of 1976, the labeled release experiment and that, and that worked by took a sample heated sorry put some water in it heated it up and saw if and put the, what they call the chicken soup which wasn't chicken soup it was a sort of broth that they thought that bacteria might like and it was ever so slightly radioactive so if any microbes took on this there would be an increase in radioactivity and the first run and the scientist who actually was there because we you know, unfortunately, she just died recently. She died within the last month. So there's this great line in the book where she said, oh, my God, it's positive. And they were convinced that on that first run. Now, over the rest of that summer, they ran the experiments at different temperatures. They changed this and changed. And it got harder and harder. It didn't, it, you know, you think with most experiments, the more stuff you do, it becomes uh, easier to understand. It was the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the mission, the biologists were in this very strange place where they said, we can't confirm there is life and we yeah, can't yeah. confirm there isn't life. And I think that was such a shock to the scientific community at the time. That was one of the reasons why people said, OK, bye, Mars, because mm. it, it wasn't un, it wasn't a, a, uh, it wasn't an unequivocal signal that, that there was or there wasn't yeah. life. And it was the, it was the ultimate. Yeah. yeah. The ultimate nail in the coffin was the lack of organics because it was very difficult to explain some of the results if there's no carbon there. Yeah. Now, since then, in 2008, the Phoenix lander, which has landed at the most northerly part of Mars yet, 67 degrees north, kind of a Reykjavik equivalent here on Earth, it dug, found lots of uh, ice under the surface, and they had the kind of grandson of some of the Viking instruments that they looked at and they discovered something called perchlorate. And the scientist who did the work said, yeah, we had to look it up as well. And the reason this is important is because perchlorate is a sort of series of chemicals with chlorine in the middle, attached to which is carbon. It's very difficult to explain, to understand, well, where did the carbon come from? If there's no organics, there's no carbon. So what they think has happened is there were perchlorates within the Viking observations but when these things are heated up, they catch fire. So it's literally like, you know, literally could be the evidence, there was evidence of organics or there could be something there and poof, went up in a puff of smoke. 
And there's a postdoc who we spoke to in Paris called Melissa Guzman, who is getting all the original data. Now, this shows how things have changed. It's all a yeah. microfilm. It's all done. You know, and she's using citizen science to get people to run computer time to see if they can trace the steps to see, well, if there was percolate there, would it produce this and what's the next? So it might, there's still hope that Viking might have, might have found something that just went up in a puff of smoke. Wow. So it was How about that. Yeah. That's and crazy. the irony here is, by the way, my school asked me not to do A level chemistry because I'm, you know, so having somebody who, who managed to mess up his A level chemistry, talking to people about really convoluted chemistry is quite ironic, really. But <laughs> it, the, the, the problem is, it's all very, very convoluted and it's not obvious. It's not Martians waving at you. It's biochemical. Is it, well, at what point does chemistry become biochemistry and the steps towards that? And it's very arcane and very involved, but there's hope. That's the great thing. Definitely, yeah, it is really, really involved. Uh, now, coming to the present, and let's yeah. talk. About, let's talk about perseverance, and what is that going to do, and how is that going to change what we know about Mars? A great question. So, as we speak, uh, perseverance is now less than a hundred days away. So, on yeah. the on February the eighteenth next year. Friday at eight o'clock, so we can all have our tea and watch on live. It will barrel straight into a crater as a bullseye. It's called Jezero Crater. It's about 30 miles across. And it's going to land in the sort of top corner where it's really interesting that they found an area where this crater, first of all, is very old. Uh, it's one of the oldest surfaces they think they've found on Mars. And you do that by count. Uh, sorry counting craters, if I put my false teeth in, I can say that. Um, and they know that that's probably where there's also been part of a lake that formed, and also there's a breach in the wall where either the water went in or came out. Now, that's really exciting for biologists, purely because of the conditions four billion years ago, when Mars was probably warmer, it had a thicker atmosphere, and there may well have been hydrothermal vents. And what's also curious with this crater, Jezero crater, is it's one of the few places on Mars where from orbit they've seen carbonates. Now what that means is you've got carbon dioxide atmosphere, water, you get seltzer. And nowhere on Mars has it really seen because the atmosphere has changed and dust has covered all this stuff up, but there's, there's evidence for carbonates. So in other words, there, there must have been water there. Now for how long, or what temperature, and more to the point at what, uh, whether it was acidic or alkaline, that's really the key question. So Perseverance will land. It's not a summer rerun of Curiosity. It looks similar, but it's different. And it's got a different suite of instruments. And one of which is called Sherlock, a great acronym. And it's on the end of a turret and it fires a laser beam uh, at a microscopic target. And it will measure the luminescence coming back. And if there's anything that could be organic, uh, something vaguely biological, like a lipid, which is one of the fatty acids and all that sort of stuff, it will it will be able to see them. But this you, you're talking about, um, here's the book, and you're talking about a, a sort of target that's a 50th of the, uh, the width of a page. Yeah. So it's a really, really microscopic area that will be magnified, the laser will be fired, um, the signal will be measured, and they will look up and say, okay, even greater is just to make sure they've taken a sample of Mars back. So there's a, a sample of a Martian meteorite that was picked up in Oman in 1999. That's also on Perseverance, because what they'll then do is they'll test the instrument and then do a test on the... So in other words, they've already measured this back on Earth, and they can make sure the signal they're getting back, you know, there's, not, there's nothing particularly... You know, it's a control result, because they know they've looked at this thing and they can carry on looking at this thing on earth to say, yeah, we, you know, it's, the instrument's working perfectly. So that's really exciting. I mean, they've not said we will discover life. What they're talking about is the next steps in biosignatures, which in plain English means a few more steps along the line to life. And if it's pointing in that direction, then we know, um, you know, there'll be something really exciting there. So that, so for an old geezer like me, you know, coming up to 60, here I am, you know, sort of, yeah, young, you youngsters. And it's a bit like that. And finally, after 40 years, somebody might unequivocally say, yeah, there's, there's something there that's really, you know, the next step to life. And, that, you know, we could all be 
bowled sideways. They might discover something that they didn't expect. I mean, one of the things, as I'd say, from anybody who's interested in Mars, it still is a completely alien, bizarre world that still has the capacity to spring surprises. So who knows? Watch this space. Yeah, definitely. There's, it definitely has sprung so many surprises in the past. And everyone thinks yeah. it's sort of this barren land that, well, there's nothing really going on on it. But there is there is a lot beneath the surface that, um, if you read about, there is lots going on. And that's why we're continuing to go there. Yeah, I mean, to, to take one example, which again is in the book, the InSight lander has landed. It's taken the first magnetometer down to the surface. Mm -hmm. So what it's doing is measuring the magnetic field all around. And its measurements are out of whack with measurements taken from orbit by a factor of about 10, 100. So there's something going on. Is it underneath the surface? One of the theories is there might be local concentrations of, of magnetism caused by individual ancient rocks. I mean, that's how clever, this is how accurate these measurements will be. So who knows? And that what's happening inside out within the interior of Mars is, is the last great unknown, because that tells you the, the mole on the inside has been gone in and keeps popping back up again. It's finally gone in and they're hoping to get the measurement of how much heat and then they can go away, do a calculation and it will refine the measurements of how much heat is available now, how much there was in the past. It's discovered Mars quakes, so there's some sort of activity going on underneath. Now, the other great uh, mystery of Mars, which again, you might, might have read about, is methane in the Martian atmosphere. Um, which is curious because it was only discovered as recently as 2003 and the mission that should have sol you know, resolved some of the inconsistencies has not found it. And recently yeah. that mission, the, the, the Trace Gas Orbiter, a Russian European mission, they've discovered some new spectral lines that, so there might be methane, but it's kind of hiding underneath those spectral lines. So it's still springing, you know, nobody would have said that. Nobody would have thought that even six months ago. So. Well, what's, what's the latest on the other missions? And I know lots of, um, especially the UK space industry and um, the European Space Agency have, for the past couple of years, been really excited about ExoMars. Yeah. Well, ExoMars is a, is a long-term program. And the first element was actually the Trace Gas Orbiter. Um, and the Trace Gas Orbiter took with it the Skipper early lander, which unfortunately didn't work. But, you know, yeah. Mars... You know, it's it's a host, it's a very tough environment too. So the Rosalind Franklin rover will be carried on the Russian Kazachok, which has been delayed by two years. Mm. And uh, I think that was a set, very sensible decision. Now, in the last week, one of the things that the, the, the announced is they've done the, the fabled parachute tests, because the atmosphere of Mars is it brings you all the worst things that you don't want. It's worse than Christmas Day at our house, you know, all the presents you didn't want. But the Martian atmosphere is, it's very, very uh, tenuous, but there's enough atmosphere there to affect when you come in through the atmosphere. So you need a heat shield. It's also very unpredictable. When you're trying to model where it's coming in, um, the atmosphere balloons out and balloons down and whatever. So trying to pop open a parachute is a fairly critical thing to be able to do. And as you probably know, in the run-up to the test last summer, every time they tested the parachutes, there were failures and there was tears. And they've started the test. I mean, it's not been held by coronavirus. Yeah, they've done yeah. a test this this week in Oregon. And from what I've read, um, they're much more successful, but there's still tears in the, in the design. And I think from memory, it's the biggest parachute anybody's ever built. So they've got to get it right. And, and so there'll be a lot of work going on onto that. But... When it goes, it will land. It will land in a place called Oxia Planum, uh, which is interesting because it may well have been the edge of this, this mythical sea that might have been on the surface of Mars. It depends who you talk to. It's one of the, you know, some people close the door. Um, there was a quote which we put in the book where we said, we asked one person, do you think there was once an, an ocean on Mars? And this person said, and I quote, some days I do, and other days I think it's very silly. And it, it really is. That's another one of these mysteries because there's not much evidence geologically. You would think if there was a sea, you would see the evidence for you know beaches and whatever, but there's there's not no evidence for that. And the atmospheric model is like it because um, it would mean that the atmosphere was thicker to have had a, a surface 
spread of water. So there's, this has been going on. They're sort of meeting in the middle. And when the, the Rosalind Franklin rover lands, it will land in a completely, it will look very, very different to a lot of the landing sites because there's a lot of clay there. And clay is water that's bubbled up and heated and there was lots of water there. And the landing site might look different um, and it will land. And it's got this drill which now a year ago, if you said to somebody two meters, they'd sort of look at now everybody knows what two meters is, right? Stand away from me for two meters. It will dig <laughs> under the surface for two meters. And yeah. several people we've spoken to have said, yeah, that's that's going to be, you know, you pull that core out and you take the, the sample uh, and analyze it, then you might, yeah, that might be another odds on chance to find something, but we'll see. So it's been delayed by two years. I think it was sensible. Um, and would you know they'll do more parachute tests to make sure that because as it comes in through the atmosphere it's got you know it, it's got to slow down and then in fact it fires a mortar i think force there's force there's two sets of parachutes so it fires a mortar a little drogue parachute pulls the big one that drops off and then another one and so and i've got to make sure that that works and it's in, virtually impossible to predict and as somebody said to us Modeling the atmosphere of Mars for at the entry phase is, is art, not science. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean it's all it's all great trying to dig in on the surface of Mars, but what about the sample return missions, which I think a lot of people are excited about because. Yeah. Um, well, I, I said earlier, I described Viking as let's take them take the kitchen sink to Mars. There are people today who say even launching Perseverance and. Uh, all these missions, we just want the sample back. Yeah. Now, in, again, within the last week, um, it's expensive to be able to do that. And Perseverance is the first phase of that, you might say. Um, it will land. It will hopefully trundle around, pick up samples, and then it will take some on board and drop some on the surface. In 2026, the next mission will go, and that will be a joint American ESA European Space Agency mission so that will land and there'll be a fetch rover which will be built in Stevenage like uh, Rosalind Franklin and it has to do one thing only and that's to be a Martian mini cabin it has to travel on the surface of Mars faster than any other rovers have been now rovers don't exactly travel at great speed but this one's got to travel at least three times faster because it's going to go and pick up these samples then it's going to bring it back to the lander put them in this kind of shell or sort of, shell, sort of holder, a series of concentric holders, and then it's got to go back up to, to orbit. Now, they've described the architecture, as they call it. So it's, we have this mission, it lands and blah, and blah, and blah, and blah. And one, it's very complicated. Two, this week they've said, actually, the basic idea is it's sound, but we think one of the missions, it might be another couple of years before it gets there. Yeah. Um, and for me, as I've said to several people, you know the bit in the Bond film where the villain says there's two ways to shoot a crocodile. One way is you shoot it, and the other is you stick your hand in and you take the teeth out one by one. And returning samples from Mars is the James Bond villain equivalent of taking the individual teeth out. You can't get your sample on Mars, put it on board the rocket, and say, oh, look, there's the Earth from one go. Yeah. You've got to take yeah. all these samples, you've got to put them in, you've got to make sure that they pick up, You've got to put them in this container. It's then got to be transferred to within a rocket. And so the, the, the first bit of the journey home you take with you, and that's the first time anybody's taken a rocket to Mars to, to come back. So yeah. it's got to find them. And then you've got to meet the orbiter, and it's got to catch. And Mars is, at mo is, a, is usually between at least 8 and 20 minutes of light travel away. In other words... You can't do it. You can't set a mission control and go fetch, collect. It's all got to be done autonomously. Yeah. When you do that, you get these samples. You've then got to put this container. You've got to then make sure nothing of, of the Martian environment comes into contact with the bit that comes back to Earth. So there's still an ongoing debate how they do that. It will go into this thing. Then you've got to fire it home. And then you've got to... So lots and lots of complicated stages. Now, there's no question in mind that it'll all be done. The question mm -hmm. is, can they all be done on, in, in one go? The, yeah. the, the, the people who've looked at the architecture this last week have said, the basic idea is sound, 
but you know there's got to be some leeway here of that and all that will be worth it because something like 500 grams so it's about you know mince for two people for their tea will come back and they will dull this out you know it'll be you you can have a kilo, you can have a, a micro kilogram, you can have this and whatever. And that's the point at which, uh, as I, uh, you know, to use another analogy, in The Wizard of Oz, when it goes from black and white to colour, it's exactly like that. Because what's the point of taking instruments to Mars when you've got much better instruments in your lab at home? And if you, you know, let, let's get the samples back, and that's the moment you crack them open and can do all this amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, it would just be easier to just go there yourself and take all your equipment with you. Um, so yeah. it, this was actually a question. I am which... available. I've got it. Yeah, I've got a passport. I've got a good <laughs> driving license. You know, I'm still available. This was, yeah, this was actually a question we were asked um, on our last week Thursday night talk with Sarah Kudas. Uh, we were discussing the launch of her book, um, Look Up Our Story with, with the Stars. And someone asked from the audience that, uh, would you go to Mars? Um, and what if... It was like a, it was a one-way trip. Well, I'm an old geezer, so I would be quite happy to go because, you know, I'm, I'm, that would, you know, I'd rather go to Mars and die there than, you know, of, of COVID complications or something. Um, yeah. I, it will happen. Um, but again, it's not, it, it, if you think getting a sample back is complicated, yeah. you've got to take human, and all, and, you know, and there are still fundamental questions about whether the human frame can can survive the journey there, the radiation environment, you land there, um, how do you get back and all, and it will happen, I'm sure. Um, as to who will do it, as to when, you know, could be 20 years, maybe 30. Um, that really isn't a, a cheery fellow that I am. That's not really a question about life on Mars. That's really death on Mars. Because I do think that in the attempt to try and go to Mars, somebody will die. So it might as well be me because I'm in my fifties and you know I you know I'm available. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And why why should we go there? Why should we go to Mars? Why should we go to Mars? That's another great fundamental question. Yeah. Um, if I wasn't here now, I could take take this up, show you out of the window Mars itself. And if anybody's um, not seen Mars, you should do. This is why it's National Astronomy Week because it's bright. It's in the sky. And the simplest explanation, which I think, because I've been looking at this, I've talked to people, uh, people have asked me the same question, why should we go to Mars? And I will paraphrase the mountaineer, George Mallory, who was asked, why did he want to go to Everest? And he said, because it's there. And that's the, that's the only explanation I can give to you. Why, why should we go there? Because it's there. It's part of, you know, DNA, it, at the risk of sounding like a poundland Carl Sagan, I'm going to you know start talking about human destiny and all that kind of stuff. But actually, it's part of what we do as human beings. It's what we explore. For good, for bad, doesn't matter. It's It will be the next sort of quantum leap in, in our evolution. And because why should we do it? To prove that we can. Wow. Well, that's I should have had an or I need an organ to go this because we can. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll, we'll add sound effects before we upload this on YouTube. Um, so for anyone watching this at a later date, uh, they'll have all the sound effects in there. Yeah, we'll have the sound effects there. Oh, well, that's such a great note to end on. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in on YouTube. Um, thanks for watching. Make sure you're subscribed if you aren't already uh, to support the channel so we can continue to bring you amazing talks like this, um, amazing speakers from the space industry uh, like Nick, who's done such an amazing job tonight. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed it. But before you go, um, the reason why we were here is for this amazing new book, which I've actually started reading and you should get your hands on it too. Um, now, I was speaking to Nick um, offline before we came um, live on YouTube is we are going to try and get you some signed and personalized copies. Um, hopefully within the next few weeks, we're going to have some sort of arrangement, um, though that is subject to, of course, national lockdown and see, seeing what we can do. Uh, but hopefully we can get um, some signed and personalized copies out to you before Christmas. Um, so stay tuned on our social media channels 
and um, head over to our website uh, to get the latest. And we'll hopefully have the book up on our website where you can buy signed and personalized copies, um, hopefully within the next few days. Um, so make sure you're, um, you follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, that'd be really great. Um, and make sure you get your hands on this book because it is a very good read and I can tell and I've only read the first chapter and it's it's it's, it's a good one um so thank you Nick for and thank you Elizabeth as well um yeah. for doing such a great job uh, unfortunately Thursday's not a great day for working science journalists because all the papers come out and she's in Canada so I've agreed to drone on about you know here and, and whatever it is an American publisher by the way so we've been waiting for the clipper ships to cross the the, yeah the atlantic so but they, they're they here now um so you know you should be able to get your hands on copies and it would be our absolute pleasure to sign them for you thank you and thank you for watching tonight yeah thank you for watching thank you for tuning in before you go one last thing uh space store are actually doing something extra special for christmas we're doing a 12 gris 12 gifts of christmas um so look out for that on our social media pages um it was um, it was it's something new we've tried this year. It's like our twelve best gift, twelve best gifts. I've forgotten how to speak um, that you can get uh, for Christmas. So go check out um, our social media for that um, if you want to get your hands on some out of this world Christmas gifts. Um, and don't forget, tune in next Tuesday for the roundup with Nick Howes and Terry Mosley, uh, where we bring you the latest and greatest of space news. Um, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Um, I've learned so many new things about Mars, um, and I'm sure the audience has as well. And yeah. if you're watching this on Catch Up, go check out this book, uh, The Search for Life on Mars. Um, it, it's, it's great. Uh, thank you so much, Nick. It's been a pleasure having you. My pleasure to be here, and to thank you for, to everyone for listening. I don't often talk about Mars, but, you know, my God, when I do, you know, I know my stuff. So there we go. <laughs> You most definitely do. Um, well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys stay safe, take care, and have a good evening.